You're listening to No Lasting City, probably the second best podcast in the world. I'm Matthew Johnston, and with me today is young Toby. This podcast is a ministry of Riverbend Bible Church, and our goal with this podcast is to distract you from the mundane and to ravish your minds with the glory of God manifested in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Our guest today is Lewis Allen. Lewis is the pastor of Hope Church in Huddersfield in the United Kingdom. Lewis is the author of The Preacher's Catechism, and we are so thrilled to have Lewis with us today. Lewis, his wife Sarah, their five children, moved to Huddersfield in 2010 after 12 years of pastoral ministry in Gunnersbury Baptist Church in West London. Lewis is a keen student of theology and in his spare time is researching for a doctrinal degree at Oxford University. And Lewis has published several books on Christian living and ministry. And the one that has really struck a chord uh, with us is, as I said, the preacher's catechism. So, Lewis, thank you so much for joining us today, all the way from the United Kingdom. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Toby. It's young Toby, but it's not young Lewis, is it? I noticed that. But Yeah, okay. although... Um, because we're recording this podcast on video, I can tell you full well that Lewis has a full head of hair. He is not follically challenged in any way, he shape does, or form. doesn't he? <laughs> and so he's looking young and crisp. But Lewis, um, yeah, just thank you uh, for being uh, with us. And um, listeners, I was on a recent break and opened up the copy of The Preacher's Catechism, which is really a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, it has as its, well, I'll let Lewis speak to that a little more, but if you're familiar with the Westminster Shorter Catechism, comes in a question and then answer format, and Lewis has written a book uh, for preachers uh, in a question and answer format. It is uh, sweet, gospel-saturated, uh, gospel tincture, um, and it was uh, just such a blessing to be able to read that book. And um, wonderful to have Lewis here today. Lewis, can you just begin by telling us what inspired you to write The Preacher's Catechism? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, I can remember where I was when I thought, I have to write this book. But I won't, I won't go off on that little detour. But I think that, that strong moment of I have to write this book was, was a, a sharp focusing of just growing convictions that I'd read lots of excellent books about preaching over the years. They were largely manuals, or at least those written in the last 30 years, were largely manuals of how to preach. They were terrifically useful to me. But the books that really quickened me and fired me, and I think helped me build a theology of preaching, um, were the 19th century manuals about homiletics and pastoral theology, which explored, already gave me a sense of the majesty of preaching, the difficulty of preaching, the mystery of preaching. And, and, and you don't get that in how to preach manuals. And I think I was at that stage of being, I think, around 20 years um, in ministry, and I still very much felt that I was learning um, but I preached, I preached a few thousand sermons and I was reflecting a lot on that stage of, of life and ministry and really thinking about longevity, how to deal with some of the, the disappointments of my ministry, where to gain encouragement, how to keep perspective, how to keep going. So <laughs> in the moment, all of those sort of thoughts rushed in and I thought, I have to write this book. I have a love of historical theology. Um, I'm not a Presbyterian. I have a different covenantal and sacramental theology from some Presbyterian distinctives and ecclesiological too. But the Shorter Catechism was was a, a work that I'd, I'd worked with and had been blessed by. And I thought, wouldn't it be exciting and stretching to interact with it and see if I could craft um, something of a theology of preaching for the preacher? to bring encouragement um, and just help brothers stick at what often is just a, an exhausting, a demanding, a difficult task. But too often we lose sense of just what a glorious and a vital task it is. And that's what I needed to recapture for myself and wanted to share with others. So helpful. 
incredibly helpful. And, you know, I think we're, my wife and I have been at Riverbend Bible Church now for nine years, and it was a good break. And after blessed seasons and then commingling of, you know, the usual challenges and the like, and really for me, the way you're writing pinpointed um with the questions that you ask, um, it really does uh, press into what motivates uh, a pastor to continue to preach, to preach um, any any uh, quote-unquote respectable sins um, that may be lying under the surface, um, failures, weaknesses, um, and then giving us, yeah, giving us not only... Um, sound doctrine but also a gospel motivation motivation from the person uh, and work of christ to to keep going not only keep going as a preacher but to keep going uh in growing as a preacher thank you yeah i haven't read the book um but it sounds less of uh how to preach and and why we preach is is that a fair assessment or is that not quite accurate i yeah i think so toby i think that's it it's it's yes it's not a how to preach it is a why to preach it is a so let's keep on preaching let's not lose heart mm. let's not give in to cynicism or weariness let's let's know where there are deep wells of encouragement and reassurance let's keep our vision on Christ, who is the Word, and give ourselves trustingly to to this. I think there is so much mystery in preaching. I'm often preaching, thinking, "Well, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if anything is going on." This is the strangest experience that I engage in once a week, regularly twice a week. Um, it's so strange to give yourself in hard preparation wrestling with the text and fighting for time and there are so many pastoral and leadership and administrative and evangelistic responsibilities um and to get through a week with that deadline every single week and to give yourself to this mysterious work and then to empty yourself there and go away thinking what just happened um and will anything happen from this and, you know, Jesus is always telling us God's kingdom work is invariably slow and often invisible. Um, and the joy of just walking with a congregation, seeking to shepherd them, giving yourself to them <laughs> along the way with the inevitable disappointments that you, you see growth, you see fruit, you see progress. And you think, gosh, the word did it all. The Lord used mm. me, but the word did it all. So I, I, mm. I want to remind people of the strangeness and the mystery of preaching. So that when disappointments come, we're not just too devastated. Or we think, well, that shouldn't happen because it will happen. The Bible is just so frank with us. There are lots of inglorious failures in preaching ministry. We just have to keep on going, but not just out of sheer grittiness but out of a christ-centered perspective and uh and, and a deep integrity and a desire to mm. honor the lord feed the sheep preach to the lost week in week out in happy times and just very very sad and difficult times as well mm. when i think of the book it it's a deep breath is what it is it's a deep breath um and uh you know to to read so many familiar names in there as you know not knowing the author although getting to know him now not knowing the author too well and just reading uh, all the mentions of the the names of the 17th century john owen and the like there's a familiarity there that feeds the soul as you're drawing down from uh trusted uh theological resources and a richness and that um, coupled with the warm pastoral gospel tincture um, makes it a very special, special book. Um, 
you are a preacher. You have been preaching for several decades now, and you've written a wonderful book. Um, over several decades, and it doesn't take long to be in a season where you're facing adversity, whether it's adversity in your own life, in the life of your family, in the life of your church, in, the, in just adversity in many different flavors and shapes and colors. Lewis, what have you found helpful during seasons of preaching through adversity and what advice would you give for preachers going through adversity of some kind? Thanks, Matt. Um, you will suffer. And life will go horribly wrong and ministry will go horribly wrong. But I think we think, well, it might do to the guy down the road, but it probably won't to me. Um, to take a verse slightly out of context, I know 1 Peter 4.12, Peter's talking to Christians who are facing state-sponsored persecution when he says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial you're experiencing. Um, that's not us yet in the UK. Um, but preachers are often astonished by suffering and, and very resentful. We think, Lord, I'm, <laughs> I'm working for you, as if that's some sort of fire blanket against fiery trials. So suffering will come. And I think um, if we actually think, no, it won't, or it won't be bad, then our ministry <laughs> will just won't be very good when it does come. Um, I think I'd say when adversity comes, obviously all the stuff of believe the gospel, pray, plead, weep if that's appropriate, gather people around you, get the pastoral counsel. I think often we preachers are a, we're a fairly kind of stubborn, stubborn, determined lot who actually spend quite a bit of time on our own, slave to email, servants of prep, all those things. And I think the impulse of suffering for us men and us leaders um, take us to an, an even more solitary place, which I think is spiritually and emotionally, psychologically unhealthy. We we need people to to walk with us. We need to invite them in. So I think if you're going through a period of adversity, a season of adversity as a preacher, you should, as much as you can, bring people around you. But probably even then you'll feel the isolation and the, no one gets this, which every sufferer does. Um, I think if I can add a couple more things, Matt, I would say um, preach out of your experience. No, don't deny it. Don't sort of put it in a separate box in your mind or heart or diary. But don't preach about your experience. Um, Congregations often love it when the preacher suddenly starts talking about how broken he is. Or um, People need to know that we are human and we're fragile and we cry as they cry and horrible things happen. Um, but we've got to be very careful in the pulpit how we speak of things, lest we sound self-important, um, lest yeah, lest we're actually elevating ourselves or or thinking, gosh, my life is hard. By implication, aren't you privileged to have me still working for you in this hard season? It can go terribly, terribly wrong. And I think actually, when we're going through adversity, we might just be starting to be useful to the people we preach to. Because their lives are, are usually far more full of adversity than ours. Yes, we have the stress of being leaders and we live complicated, time-pressured lives with multiple expectations on us. But usually people who are in preaching ministry have some degree of giftedness, organising themselves, getting their lives together. Many of the people we serve just live in a world where the secular world is nasty and brutal to them. Work is hard to come by or hard to stay in or a horrible experience. They face so much adversity. And, you know, the Lord does want to have broken hearted, Christ like, 
grace dependent preachers and we we always want to try and outrun suffering and hardship but god has his way of in love hunting us down bringing us into adversity maybe keeping us there for months or years or decades and then we start to get all the bible says about heartbreak and tears and longing for heaven and the wickedness of the world and the glory of god's love and the availability of grace and as we yield and learn and humble ourselves we grow we grow and and that's just so gloriously obvious in the pulpit because people by and large don't want to listen to a super well educated highly intelligent driven pastor who can preach with pinpoint biblical theological and exegetical accuracy they want to see a man who is feeding on christ and passing on what he's discovering and being changed by grace so i don't know if there's anybody that that's useful to they're just a collection of thoughts slightly slightly scattergun um just if i can just double back on the be careful about preaching about your experience you know we're not to wear a mask we're not to give the impression that we've got it all together sometimes it's right they see tears they know about our heartache we just need to be very careful and selective in what we're saying and how we're sharing matt is any of that helpful do you want to push me on any particular bits so incredibly helpful brother so incredibly helpful and i think all the pastors and preachers out there would be um certainly uh agreeing and then um uh being blessed by what you've just stated i remember john piper did a biography on charles spurgeon uh, mm. and it's called preaching through adversity and i can remember first listening to that years and years ago um listening to it slowly driving in a car going around a paddock oddly enough um just listening to piper unfold the experience of charles spurgeon and different challenges of um, having to preach through adversity and uh, yeah it, it is a real thing and I can't help but wonder if at least in my life a lot of it comes from the Lord knows just how self-reliant I can be and so many yes. times throughout my preaching ministry I've noticed that God will bring things into my life tangible that make me very tired and weak and um because i he knows how prideful and rely self-reliant i can be and so the adversity is a grace um and i can think in the in the darkest of times there's that sweetest of communion and consolation with the lord um and the sad part is is we just rinse and repeat and do it all again and have to keep learning the lessons mm -hmm. over and over um but yeah i'm really grateful for what you've unfolded there um yeah it's it's an interesting dynamic where the lord uh has to ever break us and humble us to to keep us effective and useful i i think um the preaching that has most impacted me uh, has been when the man is um is is authentic he's not becoming an echo of that person's feedback and that person's feedback and that person's feedback and simply just um, bending and bowing to all the subjective feedback that comes and then totally losing his authenticity which is one of the things that was brought out in that preaching through adversity adversity uh message was not to do that and when there's an authentic man uh, preaching with a broken heart i think that's some of the most powerful uh preaching um that i've i've experienced yes yes and yes i'd agree man i was um so you, you're both uh preachers and have preached a lot more than me i think i could count on one hand how many times i've preached maybe two um 
But can you? And you've been doing through... a good job too, Toby. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I don't have as many uh, opportunities to fail yet. Um, but can can you guys walk me through the difference between preaching about your ex- your experiences or your heartaches that you're currently going through, um, and preaching from them? Because I think there's there's a lot of people in the world or uh, in the world in the the global sense, not the secular sense. Um, that that do use uh, their family or their circumstances as pithy uh, illustrations or, or things like that. Um, how do you how do you practically avoid using it as an opportunity to um, yeah preach about yourself? But how do you actually authentically bear your heart while also not drawing attention to yourself yeah. while you're drawing attention to the word? Thanks, Toby. That's very important. If that's a question to both of us, I'm very happy, Matt, if you want to go first. I'm just going to add a tiny little uh, footnote on the front end, which is bizarre because footnotes are normally on the back end. And we, I want to hear from you, Lewis. But what I do want to say <laughs> is I can hear my preaching professors saying, um, you are not to be the hero of your own story. Number one, that helps me. And number two is I just always, I can't get, Charles Spurgeon's words out of my head, preach to broken hearts because in every pew you're sure to find some. And so that aids, those two things aid me in that to, th- to think of the, the congregation uh, in front of me, both while I'm preaching in the act of preaching, but also in the act of preparation as well. But I would love to hear Lewis on that. Yeah. Th- this is possibly not the central thing and I feel very strongly about this more so as the years go on we we must can we should we ever have an illustration which involves our children if we have them or our spouse if we're married I think young preachers often you know wow child said x or child did y and and then the child appears in the sermon now I mean I told a humorous, appropriate story just a few months ago about a a little funny misunderstanding I had with one of my children. But that was when they were very, very little. Um, And and they weren't there. I think there's too many preachers who talk about their children and give funnies when the children are there. I think ministry kids live with incredible pressure on them. And many of them would very happily be invisible on a Sunday and it's exciting maybe for three, four year olds to have their name mentioned in a pulpit, but not much beyond that. So um, yeah, that's something I, I think can be, can be very inappropriate actually bringing our families in, into the pulpit. Um, if to talk about, yeah, well, if you are in a season of, of suffering, maybe that involves you, maybe that involves others, you know, those in your family, um, Can you talk about it? I guess if there's some sort of, you know, maybe a health problem in your family, which I don't know, involves hospitals or something, the congregation very quickly is gonna gonna get to hear about that. Um, And I think you have to be just very, very sparing um, and choose to say what's real and what exalts grace and what thanks the saints for their care. Um, But I'm always conscious that the things I've gone through or I'm struggling with there's just people in the church who are dealing with so much worse year in and year out. And I don't want them to hear me talking about my struggles in any way that makes them think I devalue their struggles or I've forgotten their struggles. Um, so I try to be alive to when, when things in my life are hard, I try to... I pray for grace to see the equivalent in somebody else's life or to feel their sufferings more so that I can move towards them pastorally with more tenderness and skill or that I can speak about suffering just more carefully um, and tenderly in the pulpit. I'm sorry, I don't feel that's of great value. Do you want to teasing thing out of, of me or of any of that. Oh, no, I think it's helpful. Um, I think 
hardships one thing when you when you're going through that as you're all get, always going to be delicate how you handle that in all scenarios i think um what about as a on the flip side as a preacher if you're um not in the depths of woe but you're in the highs of highs and you're having a great season i guess that's just easier you can just focus on the word and, and just rejoice in all things but so i guess i've answered my question a little bit <laughs> yeah um yeah <clears throat> i i don't know some folks in 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 the church where past where i think this is strange but I, I rarely talk about things which i think are going really well in my life because i'm just not always confident i can do that in a way which would actually <laughs> perhaps encourage others or would not be misheard as being prideful or um we we're in a struggling town a very socio-economically depressed town um i'm a person who's enjoyed great educational privilege is blessed with health blessed with marriage blessed with children blessed with home ownership i own a car you know I'm off the charts on every integer of, you know, well-being. I kind of want to be very careful um, that people don't think that here comes this guy whose life is just very, very protected. Now, we've had our real heartaches, um, and many in the church know about them. Um, and yet my life looks very sorted and together for many, so <laughs> I am careful. Um, so a little example, I have a new book coming out and I haven't mentioned it to the church. But I don't think I'll mention it again because I don't want that to be misread as a, a, you know, it might sound a bit of a boast. Clever old me, I've written a book. So I'm allowed to be interested in that and grateful that the Lord's brought it to completion. But if that's not what they're interested in, why should... I don't want them to think I'm rubbing their noses in something that I've done. Now... I think I broadly get it right. I'm not an enigma to the church. <laughs> the church knows I love them and I love spending time with them and I seek them out and we're very hospitable. Um, I just want to keep listening to them, asking them what's happening in their lives. And if they ask back, then they'll get as much as is appropriate. Yeah, that's really, really good, really helpful. Um, I think one thing that, you know, and I would echo um, all that you've said there, Lewis. One thing that really um, helps me, I hope, is that we are simply there to deliver as a waiter, if you will, to use the illustration that's used by um, our seminary professors. Um, we're simply the waiter who delivers the meal that God has already prepared. We don't toy with it. We don't tinker with it. We don't change it. We just have to be faithful to deliver the meal. And when that's the conviction and the burning desire on the heart, it kind of gets all that other stuff and just cuts it off. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. And, uh, and to come with that analogy, Matt, we're not looking for tips. Yeah. Um, but we know that the way we serve people is everything to how they receive the food of God's word. I love that uh, addition there. And I'm sure I'll pass that on to the preaching professors because I'm sure that'll bless <laughs> so many others. I like that. We don't, we're <laughs> not, give you a tip. we're not looking for tips. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think of the old preacher Leonard Ravenhill. What did he say? Um, too many uh, preachers who should be fishing for men are fishing for compliments from men, something like that. Mm. Um, we're talking a lot about preaching here on this episode of No Lasting City. We're joined by Lewis Allen. Um, Lewis, who are some preachers that have heavily influenced you and importantly, why? <laughs> Oh, that's a great question. Um, I was raised in a very secular home. Um, I got converted in quite unusual circumstances as a 19-year-old. Um, I think it's quite inevitable if you have that kind of a conversion experience, you go into a church as a gifted preacher, 
he never leaves your memory. You are so indebted to him. But I was just genuinely very, very blessed in that the guy who I still consider the most, one of the most alive men in Christ that I've, I've met was my first pastor. Um, and his just, his sense of reverence and joy and utter conviction about the power of the gospel and the unashamedly theological shape he gave to his preaching in the Christian life were, were just so impacting. Um, so it, now he's he's not in pastoral ministry. He's very much in the kingdom of God doing the Lord's work. Um, but I won't mention his name because he's he's not he's not preaching now. He wouldn't be known. Um, as a university student, I was um, very impacted by. At the time, he was one of the UK's best-known preachers. Four years after he baptised me in those hundreds of sermons I gained so much from, he, his life collapsed um, into uh, an adulterous affair uh, and caused just untold anguish um, and damage to his family, the church, the kingdom. It was very, very salutary and um, reminded me that the kingdom is full of mystery and full of agony and and and, and sin abounds and the devil's at work. Um, I can look back with thankfulness to God for that ministry I received, but utter confusion as to what's going on in God's sovereign purposes, which I do, don't need to understand anyway. Um, I, I don't listen to a great deal of preaching, and I think I should listen to more. Um, if I've got, say, a couple of go-to guys with most of Christendom, I listen to Tim Keller, um, who I find, you know, uniformly helpful, don't agree with everything, <laughs> wouldn't do it with my level of mediocrity, couldn't do it as he does, but he frequently just opens up the scriptures in exhilarating ways and makes me think about how to be a better Christian and preacher. Um, and Sinclair Ferguson, I will always go to. Um, and look forward to hearing. Um, I'll probably think of a bunch of others once the podcast has finished. Um, but I often go jogging with my dog and I listen to a sermon or two. And that's that's how I enjoy my preaching. Yeah. What is it about Sinclair that you um, enjoy and are influenced by? Yeah, good question, Matt. What do I enjoy about him? Um, that he's a very self-effacing man. He wants to exalt the Savior and nobody else. Um, I guess why I so value him is the points of contact with that very first preacher that I mentioned. Um, the solutions this side of heaven to life's problems are theological, ministered in the power of the Spirit as are hearts and minds and wills are retrained to walk the narrow way with joy and hope and so his just skill in bringing theological acumen to life's problems i find just really really helpful um his preaching is always fresh he's not you know enslaved to a particular methodology it's not predictable um yeah so that does me good no, that's really great. He, if you were to, I think we should go around the podcast then um, ask uh, Toby and then I can answer that question myself too because it is it, the art of preaching. Um, it, it, it is an art and it is a calling. It is an act of worship. And um, there's something very special about uh, sitting under preaching as an act of worship and because we're so eager to be um, pleasing to the Lord in in the act of worship of preaching, um, we do listen to other preachers. Um, it's been said uh, by others that uh, preaching is more caught than taught and um, properly understood. That, that makes a lot of sense. It doesn't mean that there isn't uh, a key aspect uh to preaching that is homiletical training uh, and the like but toby what are some preachers that have 
heavily influenced you and well, why? I'd get in trouble if I didn't say uh, Matthew Johnston is a big influence as I hear him 90% of the Sunday. Matthew Johnston, I've, I've heard. This he is, is a big this deal. Is a, this, this, you have, <laughs> no, you have, um, you have started uh, on the wrong foot, Toby, there. <laughs> Well, I can <laughs> see. I, I can just. I started somewhere where I can. I can continue to climb. I didn't want to start at the pinnacle. You can build you can from build. there. Thank you, Toby. <laughs> um, recently, I've been enjoying Alistair Big. If, if I'm preaching through a passage, I'll, I'll often or teaching through a passage, yeah. I'll, I'll go to him. I find him mm -hmm. uh, uh, good in summarizing the passage and then just drawing from it simply simple applications. Um, so he's who I'm currently listening to, and if if you want some like fire or something like that, if you're going for a run, you can listen to older Steve Lawson, where he's just always right up the top. Um, and Paul Washer, he gets you going. That's that's like Christian motivation. Yes, I, I I guess you're, I guess you're running um you're running your miles more quickly. Yeah, sprinting. Washer. You know when you're doing your sprints. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're under eight minutes a mile. Oh, you're always seven and a half. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you met? Um. Yeah. You know. I think one of the greatest sermons that's ever been preached is a sermon called Ten Shekels in a Shirt." Um, it's the most downloaded sermon on the internet. Um, and it's by an old preacher called Paris Reedhead. And uh, he's no longer alive. Um, he was uh, not as robust on the doctrines of grace as we would be. Uh, he comes from that old, uh, almost old Pentecostalism, revivalism of the Leonard Ravenhill uh, ilk. Um, but that sermon uh, is, is astoundingly wonderful to listen to. Um, and why I say that is I later discovered that Paris preached that without notes. Uh, he lost his notes mm. on the way to the conference that he preached that on. And so I want to encourage anyone out there to download 10 Shekels and a Shirt by Paris Reedhead. Um, that, why I say that is because I soon went from uh, listening to that sermon. And these were just sermons that people gave me uh, when I first was converted um, later on in life, uh, I then listened to Leonard Ravenhill and, um, there was, there was, while, while they may lack, uh, the theological depth of a Sinclair Ferguson and probably what we uh, focus on from Lord's Day to Lord's Day, there's something special about those preachers. They're not, um, I think it's been described from those preachers back then. They weren't civilized. Um, they weren't so polished and clean, but they were passionate about the gospel. And so that really, from the beginning, yes. um, impacted me. And then the preaching ministry of John MacArthur really, um, really uh, impacted me on uh, significant levels. Um, just the faithfulness, the fidelity, the boldness, uh, the humility, um, and then uh, Steve Lawson, um, one of uh, preaching professors and a, and a, and a good friend um, and a mentor of sorts. Um, the preaching of uh, Mike Riccardi, Mike Abendroth, um, S. Lewis Johnson would be another one. S. Lewis Johnson would be a name maybe that not many people know, but S. Lewis Johnson was the pastor of um, uh, Believer's Chapel. Um, in Dallas, um, S. Lewis Johnson is an amazing preacher. And then the list could go on like you guys. Um, Sinclair Ferguson is certainly on that list. Um, yeah, like you, I, I, I survey preaching quite broadly and then try and wrangle the good. Um, and then I'm sure I bring some bad in there as well. But I think there's such a broad variety of preaching out there. Um, yeah, we would do well to, to listen and read. I would say I read more sermons than I listen to. Um, our preaching professors like Lawson would always encourage us to read 
sermons as part of our preparation. Yes. Yes. Um, so yeah, um, that's who I've kind of been heav- heavily influenced by. And I would say my dear friend Phil Henderson told me last week when we caught up, he had the opportunity to talk to a very experienced preacher who was one of our preaching professors. And he asked him, how long did it take you? Phil asked the preaching professor, how long did it take you to settle in um, as a preacher? And he said about 10 years. And when you think about it, that that Phil and I said, well, that's very true. Um, I'm coming up nine years, um, and I feel like I'm slowly just actually shaking off the negative um, uh, influences um, in the sense of you can see so many preachers when they first start preaching, even by the way they preach, you can see who's heavily influenced them. And I think we can be so heavily influenced at the in those very early days to to a fault because we're we're not we're not authentic yet i think we grow into our authenticity of who yes. we become yes and um i th- i think that's that's very true and i'm i'm experiencing that um man there's so much i could talk about preaching and it's lovely to have you on lewis i'd love to talk about how you would describe bad slash poor preaching um uh, if you could uh, unfold for us what, what you think of that, that would be great. Yeah, I think that would be very autobiographical, Matt. Um, <laughs> just before I go to that question, if I could just take just a few seconds, you reminded me we're, we're, we can we can include dead preachers, can't we? Uh, the preachers we would listen to, the reading of sermons. Um, my favourite deceased preacher, I think, is John Flavel, the English Puritan. Um, whenever I'm preaching on the person and the work of Christ, I will go to his volume of sermons called um, uh, The Fount of Life uh, or The Fountain of Life. Um, in the six volumes of the Banner of Truth edition, which every every Christian, every preacher, every pastor must buy, um, I, think it's in the, I think it's in the first volume. They're just a, they are sermons on person the work of Christ and they're just so full of insight and devotional tone doxological tone outstanding and there's a sermon a standalone sermon which um, Flavel actually wrote out in full and he died before he got to preach it but it was to a pastor's um, fraternal at a very very important time in English history where they had got toleration as gospel people to preach called the character of a truly evangelical minister as drawn by Christ. And that is just an incredible sermon. Emotional intelligence for the preacher, 17th century style. And transparent holiness for the preacher. The character of a truly evangelical minister as portrayed by Christ. It's on the commendation, well done, good and faithful servant. So that's John Flavel. Before you keep going. How would I describe? Go sorry to interrupt. Toby, could we hunt down that um, sermon, a link to it, and include it in the show notes? I've already got it. I'm, I'm skimming it at the moment. Young Toby is always ahead of the game. Is he? Is he? Could I, can I do this? I'm just reaching up. Um, Flavel became a bit of a project for me a few years ago. And so I took, I think, 13 of his sermons and I edited them. I worked with his perhaps older language and some of his illustrations, which didn't have any traction anymore. And I put in some head, uh, some subheadings so we could find our way through the sermons. Uh, and bless them, the Banner of Truth said that they were happy to, to publish these. So um, they published this little volume called All Things Made New, John Flavel for the Christian Life. Um, and uh, yeah, that was almost my tribute of thanks to God for such a helpful, helpful pastor, theologian. Listeners, that's on the Puritan paperback series from Banner of Truth. Uh, go and find yourself a copy of that. Thank you, Lewis, for letting us know about that. Bad, poor preaching. Um, could I flip it to... <laughs> good preaching and then your listeners are 
they 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 can they can work out what I think is less effective preaching. You can okay? do you can do whatever you like, brother. Um, uh, um, I'm looking for tone as much as I'm looking for content for good preaching. We we have a phrase in England um, where preachers might style themselves Bible teachers. Now, I get it. I do use it, um, but it can be a it can be a bloodless term, can't it? And I think there's been a lot of preaching um, in the UK, which has been information exchange. In the recovery of uh, expositional preaching, um, it has sometimes been taught that the preacher's full task is to handle the passage and the keywords are clearly and accurately. Now, we must be clear and accurate. Of course we must. We're not correctly dividing the word of truth. Um, but we bring that well-divided word with just transparent humility, joy, doxology. This is our worship. And we're seeking, as God's Spirit works, to catch people up in this devotional exercise of hearing God's word to his glory. So that as we sing after we've sung the sermon, our hearts are racing and our minds are supercharged. But we've seen a man who himself is deeply contented in Christ and who loves us and is handling us so respectfully with all the Lord's authority and with all the Lord's tenderness. Um, that's what I'm looking for when I go to hear a preacher. That's what I'm praying the Lord would increasingly make me to be a man who transparently loves the Lord and loves and respects deeply those people he's preaching to. Mm. This is not a bloodless information deposit which costs me nothing, mm. which I could do in my sleep. Mm. Mm. So tone, yeah. and then I think I pretty much said content, um, accuracy, proper exegesis, clarity, always preaching with the outsider in mind. If, if, if the church is thriving, unconverted people will be there. It's only the stuff that Tim Keller's taught us the last 30 years. We preach the gospel so winsomely, pointedly, attractively, in a salty way, that our saved friends are saying, I need to get my unconverted neighbor here in this. When the unconverted neighbor comes in, he or she thinks he's preaching to me. He's explaining this. I can get this. And gosh, he expects me to believe him. So jargon-free, clear, preached in the vernacular, um, attractive, but challenging. Um, the message of the cross must always be explained, at least in two, three, four, five crisp sentences. And the challenge and invitation given in every sermon, not in a way that's wooden or bolted on, but which comes from appropriate points in, in a passage. Um, but we're, we're preaching to us chickens. We're preaching to the Lord's people. This is a feeding of the flock. So if the unconverted there, they're saying, ah, oh, I see, they actually believe this stuff. And that guy's teaching them how to live it out. It sounds hard, but he keeps talking about the Holy Spirit is going to help them. And he really believes that heaven is real. So I could go on. I'll chop myself off there. I don't know if there's anything there you want to come back on, Matt, or... No, no, Matt. that's super, that's super helpful. Um, Do you see sometimes a lack of fervor in the pulpit from some of the reform community? I know I'm supposed to say yes, Matt, aren't I? <laughs> you I just answer, cheeky. you answer um, as yeah. freely as you like. Yeah. For, for, yeah. Fervor is such a difficult thing, isn't it? Because that looks very different yeah. um, mm -hmm. culturally. Um we have to work out, according to our culture 
um, church culture, ethnicity, cultural expectations, what it is going to look like for us with our individual personalities and enculturating us to be, well, John Wesley said, set a man aflame with love for Christ and people come for miles to watch him burn. Mm. So our burning will look different. Yes. Um, but we've got to burn. We've got mm. to burn. Mm. We can't mm. say a casual sentence in our sermons, but that doesn't mean we need noise and and an intensity which perhaps isn't us or is just quite exhausting to listen to. One of the mm. most logical, understated, modest guys I know, when he's in the pulpit, he he's full of noise. He's so loud and animated. And I find it just such a puzzle. Mm. And I find him really exhausting to listen to. Yes, yes. So yes, further, but further in a way that's effective and is authentically us. Yeah, 100%. I think sometimes preachers, they make it their goal to be um, fervorous uh, and often... Not always, but often that fervorous kind of preaching has a legal tincture rather than a gospel tincture. And then on the flip side, I find sometimes there are the guys who understand the warmth of a gospel tincture who are so, as Lloyd-Jones would put it, boring. And we must never be boring in our preaching. And so, yeah, it's such an interesting dynamic to think through. A wonderful message that Steve Lawson gave a long time ago uh, was the evangelistic fervor in preaching. And, uh, you know, he was personally mentored in preaching by R.C. Sproul. He has, you know, all his experience and wealth. And he really gave a lecture um, and broke that down. And I remember thinking, you know, there are Bible explainers and then there are Bible expositors. And, um, and I and I think uh, we'd do well to remain authentic. And I love how you put that fervor in an authentic sense because I think of sometimes when people may visit a church like ours or yours and maybe people aren't. I mean, we have people who do, but maybe, and it's wonderful expression of worship, but people aren't always maybe raising their hands and, and you know, moving around in a fervorous way. And people make, look on and criticize that from an external perspective and say, Hey, you know, what's, is this true worship? Is the spirit, you know, moving or whatever it may be. But the reality is that person, man or woman is their heart is burning as they sing those truths to God. But yes. from an external view, you can't see that. So I always want to be careful about how we speak about, um, uh, those things, just like, just like you were there. I do have many thoughts about preaching. I think sometimes um, various streams can be more given to a legal preaching. And um, and then, you know, we've got to be so careful, don't we, to not be like that drunk man that Luther spoke about who would fall off both sides of the horse. Um, there can be those that are given to much legal preaching and then there can be those that are given to, uh, you know, a, a lack of imperatival kind of preaching. So that whole indicative yes. um, imperative thing is really important in preaching to maintain. Yes. 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 Mm. Lewis, any um, final closing uh, remarks for any pastors out there um, or even um, for, for the flock? Any parting words for pastors who'll be listening as well as um, precious sheep from various congregations? I'm often just astonished and overwhelmed by how forgiving my congregation is. I stumble out of the pulpit feeling colossally disappointed and embarrassed so regularly. I can barely get eye contact sometimes with people on the door. I just say, I've done such a bad job. They must be colossally disappointed. Now, of course, and I touched on this in the book, you know, the devil rides our backs hard as preachers. Um, and often, I slowly understood this over the years, it's pride that makes me feel so heartbroken. It's not a zeal for the Lord. It's just pride. 
deep down I want to worship this image that I'm some fabulous preacher and then reality hits me and I can't cope with it. Um, but yet somewhere in there, somewhere in there, there is a desire that I really, my ministry is a blessing to people and it's tough and it feels hard when I wonder if it is. So just to get anything of value in that, preachers, praise God for your forgiving, accommodating, realistic hearers who probably don't think you're anything great, but they love you and they're grateful for you and they know your inadequacies and mediocrity even better than you do, but they stick with you and they pray for you. Be grateful for them. Often we feel at the front so isolated, but I bet they're cheering us on. And they will be really concerned if we knew what it is we often got ourselves in. Because we're on the same side. And I think as preachers, we can overthink. I've given you a great example of my own struggles. And the devil wants us isolated. And he wants us obsessed with our performance. So one little closing observation matters. Yeah, let's just be thankful again for patient, forbearing, forgiving prayerful hearers and let's just never ever lose the sense of privilege we get to do this we get to do this it's glorious the ministry which could have been given to angels has been given to us um, we must never let tiredness overloadedness cynicism and even failure cloud that vision or reduce that sense of holy calling. Lewis, thank you so much for ministering to our hearts today. Truly been a joy and blessing to have you on. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for writing the Preacher's Catechism. Thank you for being a faithful uh, pastor. And uh, we've just really enjoyed having you with us today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Toby. It's very kind of you. It's been very encouraging for me. So bless you both.